to introduce today's speaker, Charles Gami. Charles got his bachelor from Yale and his PhD from Princeton with Jeremy Goodman. He made many fundamental contributions to accretion physics, including the magneto rotational instability and simulating uh, black hole accretions. So I personally learned the statement uh, that reproducibility is the hallmark of the scientific method from Charles. And the fact that Charles open source all the codes from his group uh, and make his results uh, reproducible, you know, that really shaped the modern landscape of black hole accretion research. So with that, uh, Charles, please uh, go ahead. Okay, well, that's very kind, CK, thank you. Um, I, I heard that the Pyre webinar uh, last time was great, uh, that Ramesh gave a great talk. And uh, so I wanna set expectations right now that this is not gonna be as good. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll uh, move on from there. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, general relativistic uh, magnetohydrodynamic simulations. And uh, th these are used in a number of contexts now uh, in, in neutron star research, in, uh, in uh, uh, compact object merger calculations, uh, and in black hole accretion. And uh, I'm, I'm really going to focus on the, uh, the applications in, in black hole accretion because that's what the, the pyre is all about. Uh, so, so let's just start out with some, uh, some cool uh, animations of, uh, of uh, simulation. And uh, this shows uh, two, two panels. Uh, one shows uh, density or log of density in the meridional plane around an accreting black hole. And uh, the, the right panel shows log of density in the equatorial plane. Um, and this is a, a particular model that we've developed for uh, event horizon telescope applications. Um, it's a so-called MAD model, which means that uh, there's a substantial uh, flux of magnetic field uh, through the black hole, which is in the center here. Uh, there on the left and in the center here on the right. And uh, uh, the, uh, the, the plasma that surrounds the black hole carries in uh, magnetic fields, as, as Ramesh no doubt described last time, uh, and uh, traps them in the hole. And, and this particular uh, model has the, the maximum possible uh, flux that can be pinned in the hole without dynamically escaping. Uh, so, so the structure that you see here is, is typical of many of these uh, black hole accretion simulations. So, so most of us uh, start out these simulations with initial conditions, which are a torus uh, orbiting the, the black hole. Uh, that's, that's this here, uh, a torus or, or a Polish donut or an Einstein bagel. And, um, uh, and these, uh, these uh, tori become unstable uh, and they fall into the black hole and, uh, and, and accrete and pin flux on the hole. And uh, many of these uh, simulations produce these uh, uh, relatively empty regions over the poles of the black hole, which are sometimes known as the funnel. Uh, and uh, in, these, uh, in these regions over the poles of the black hole, the, uh, uh, the ratio of magnetic energy density to rest mass energy density is typically large. Uh, that uh, can be written as B squared over rho is much uh, greater than one. Uh, and this thing is usually defined as the so-called sigma parameter. Uh, and, uh, and this, this nearly empty region over the poles of the hole has a, a relatively well-ordered magnetic field in it. Uh, and these field lines uh, go down through the, uh, uh, through the event horizon and out uh, on the other side. And they're dragged, uh, the field lines are dragged uh, by the rotation of the black hole. And in this case, uh, the, the black hole is fairly strongly rotating. So it has a spin parameter of, of 0.94. So, um, so again, a typical outcome for uh, uh, 
one of these uh, GRMHD models of uh, an accreting black hole. Uh, I want to show you another view of this because I, I think this uh, is, is youth, useful both for showing up some of, the, um, uh, some of the main features of the simulation and also some of the pathologies, some of the numerical pathologies. Uh, so this, this again shows a logarithm of density plotted on a sphere around the black hole at a radius of 10 gm over c squared from the, uh, from the hole. And uh, you can see, again, the, the funnel up here at the top. Uh, this is the region with, with uh, sigma much greater than one. Uh, and then down at the equator is the, uh, the accretion disk. So we're just looking at a slice through the simulation at constant radius. And uh, uh, this particular model is, is different from the last one I showed you because it's a, a so-called SANE model or standard and normal evolution model, uh, uh, term uh, coined by Ramesh, uh, which has a relatively small magnetic flux through the event horizon. Uh, in addition, this model has spin of minus 0.94, which means that the black hole is spinning one way and the disk is uh, orbiting the other. And uh, you can see uh, in the funnel that there are uh, small density features that are uh, going, going clockwise uh, around the pole, which is right here. And, uh, and the disk you can see uh, is orbiting in the opposite direction. And that there's a, uh, there's a surface in between these where this, this high sigma wind uh, interacts with the, uh, the denser surrounding uh, orbiting disk. Again, a typical outcome of these, uh, these GRMHD simulations. Okay, and, and we do these uh, for Event Horizon Telescope so that we can make nice animations of uh, what the flow should look like when uh, observed by the, uh, the future constellation of satellites uh, that will give us a crystal clear picture of what's going on in uh, M87 and in the galactic center. Uh, so, so getting from the, the MHD simulations, which are a flow model, to uh, observations requires doing a radiative transfer calculation, which I'm not going to talk about, uh, but, but that's a key step in, and, uh, in, in interpreting uh, event horizon telescope observations. And we have to do it not only once, but we have to do it uh, again and again. So, uh, in Event Horizon Telescope, we're looking at uh, many uh, uh, GRMHD simulations and even more radiative transfer calculations uh, to try and identify which models uh, work with the data. Okay, so, um, so that's the, the basic uh, 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 model set that I'm going to be talking about. And uh, here's the plan for the, the remaining 40 minutes. Uh, so I'm going to talk briefly about the, the physical content of the GRMHD models, uh, dip into a discussion of the numerical methods, uh, talk about convergence testing, and, uh, uh, and then give you some uh, examples of uh, uh, simulations and analysis of those simulations, and finally talk about some of the things that really need work in this business. Okay, so start off with the, uh, the physical content. So uh, uh, in all of these GRMHD models, we have to specify a background space time. Uh, usually this is the, the Kerr metric, uh, but it could be a metric derived from an alternative gravity model. Um, in the Kerr metric, uh, there are just two parameters famously. Uh, one is the mass of the black hole and the other is the spin uh, and uh, the dimensionless spin. And, and one point to notice uh, going into this is that for ideal GRMHD calculations, meaning uh, calculations uh, in which there's no viscosity uh, and there are no radiative interactions, then the outcome of the, the simulation just scales with them. It's uh, independent of the black hole mass. Okay, so uh, Furthermore, when we adopt a general relativistic 
uh, MHD model, the, the HD stands for hydrodynamics, which means we're adopting a, a fluid model for the flow of plasma. And uh, this means that uh, we're taking uh, the full distribution function of the plasma, which depends on position, time, and uh, uh, momentum, and, uh, and replacing that with uh, a spatial density and uh, a single velocity for the plasma. Uh, and, and this is a, a key and possibly objectionable um, uh, approximation for event horizon telescope sources because the plasma is uh, collisionless. So for event horizon telescope sources, we have a very low density, very hot plasma, and the mean free path of both an electron and an ion to Coulomb scattering is large compared to the size of the horizon. So uh, the, easily the most easily calculable relaxation process which is scattering by Coulomb collisions uh, is effectively absent. And it's not clear that the plasma should be relaxed and that this procedure of replacing the full density and phase space by uh, a, a limited set of fluid variables is, uh, is defensible. Uh, however, uh, it seems likely now that there is relaxation uh, in these flows that's driven by collective effects, by kinetic instabilities uh, that produce waves and the particles scatter off of the waves and, uh, and at least relax toward a, um, uh, a, a thermal distribution. Okay, so uh, I, I just wanna emphasize that this is uh, an important approximation that's made and for at least for applications in low accretion rate black holes. And, uh, uh, and, and that it hasn't been fully justified yet. Okay, so, so once we've made that approximation, uh, we can write down the, the governing equations, which are just conservation laws. Uh, conservation laws for uh, particle number, for uh, energy and momentum, uh, and, uh, and then the Maxwell equations, which can be the source-free Maxwell equations, which can be written in the form of conservation laws. So, um, so, so I just uh, uh, want to write down and focus on a single one of these, uh, these conservation laws, which is uh, conservation of particle number, which is here. Uh, and I, I've written down the others uh, below, uh, which I, I won't spend too much time on. But uh, you know, the familiar conservation law for, for mass uh, in a non-relativistic context is here. It just says uh, that the uh, time rate of change of a density is minus the divergence of a flux of mass. And it turns out that the, um, the, the relativistic form of this conservation law in a general coordinate system looks exactly the same. It has the same form. Uh, only now uh, we have a coordinate density of uh, particles and uh, we've defined this row to be the rest mass density. Uh, and so rest mass density is just the particle number uh, multiplied by the mean mass per particle. Uh, and then the coordinate density has two other factors in it. So one, one is the time component of the four velocity, which in flat space would just be the Lorentz factor of the, uh, the flow with respect to the coordinate frame. Uh, and then it has this geometric factor, which is root minus G, which is where G is the determinant of the metric. And uh, in uh, spherical coordinates in flat space, this would just be R squared sine of theta. So it's, it's a volume element. Uh, so that's the, the density of, uh, of particles uh, uh, in, the, in the coordinate system. Uh, and then on the right hand, we have a similar expression uh, which, which now has uh, the root minus g and the, uh, the rest mass density in it, but also the, uh, the space component of the four velocity. So again, in Cartesian coordinates in flat space, this would just be the Lorentz factor uh, multiplied by uh, a component of the velocity. 
Okay. So, uh, so it turns out that all of the GRMHD equations uh, uh, can be written down uh, by analogy to the non-relativistic expressions uh, in very much the same way. Uh, the only really new term here is the, uh, uh, the way gravity is treated. So in a non-relativistic context, you would just write rho grad phi as a, a, a source term on the right-hand side of the momentum equation. And in a relativistic context, you have this new thing, uh, which is the connection, uh, which uh, encodes the effect of the gravitational field on the, uh, the momentum of the plasma. Okay, so, um, uh, so that's the, the, uh, some of the physical content of the GRMHD models. Uh, in addition, we make an ideal uh, MHD approximation. Uh, so that means that the Lorentz force, E plus V cross B on C, uh, vanishes. And, uh, uh, and that's true in a relativistic context as well although we write it a little bit differently as the four velocity here contracted with uh, the field tensor for the electromagnetic field, which is an anti-symmetric uh, four by four matrix, uh, which has the electric field and magnetic field embedded in it. And this is a really good approximation in almost all of the uh, contexts uh, uh, that we're interested in with the possible exception of regions where the density uh, is very low. And then the density can become so low that uh, there aren't enough charges left to carry the currents that are required in an MHD model. And, uh, and, and then the, uh, the MHD approximation can break down. So we worry about uh, uh, the quality of the MHD, ideal MHD approximation in low density regions. Okay, so in, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip along and not talk about extensions to uh, GRMHD. And now I'm going to go on uh, and talk about numerical methods. Okay, so we have a set of governing equations. Uh, the governing equations look a lot like the governing equations for uh, non-relativistic MHD in a Newtonian gravitational field. Um, and uh, in fact, they can be written as a, a hyperbolic system of conservation laws. And we can use absolutely standard methods for, uh, for integrating these equations. So uh, I, I grew up on uh, uh, Levesque's uh, uh, book on hyperbolic systems of conservation laws, and I, I recommend it to all of you uh, as, a, as a starting point. Um, we, we uh, in my group, uh, and, and actually many of the groups in this business that are integrating GRMHD models use uh, a, a very simple uh, flux schemes. So we typically use it's called the local lax Friedrichs flux, uh, which is uh, charitably uh, a very simplified Riemann solver. And uh, it's, it's widely used in this business because it's very robust. And, uh, and robust is good uh, for reasons that you'll see in a moment. Um, so in addition to this, we have the same problems that, uh, that non-relativistic MHD has. We have to preserve the, diver the constraint that the divergence of the magnetic field is zero, which in a, a relativistic context looks like this. Uh, and uh, we do this uh, typically using constrained transport, um, although it's possible also to just use constrained damping in a Debner type scheme. So there's, there, there are two ways of controlling the development of the monopole density in these, uh, uh, in these simulations, either constrained transport, which uh, maintains the monopole density to be of order the machine precision, uh, or constrained damping, which allows the monopole density to fluctuate, but then damps it away and uh, propagates it away over time. Uh, I, I almost always use uh, constrained transport, but my former uh, collaborator, Gabor Toth, strongly recommends uh, Dedner damping and says, it's so easy, you should try it, you'll never go back. Uh, so uh, either of these appear to be uh, viable approaches. Uh, so, um, 
so again, the, the numerical problem is essentially the same as in non-relativistic uh, GRMHD. And, uh, and I think the pioneers in this field uh, realized this, uh, including Shinji Koita uh, and Sergei Komisarov, uh, uh, and also John Hawley uh, were, were uh, early workers in this field and uh, adapted methods from non-relativistic hydrodynamics. So, so what's the difference here? So why is, uh, why is GRMHD uh, more difficult? So, so one reason it's more difficult is uh, because the relationship between uh, what are called, what are referred to in this field as conserved variables and primitive variables uh, are more complicated. So, so just as an example of what I mean by primitive and conserved variables, uh, let's take a flat space-time example. The, uh, the rest mass density is, is rho, and rho is an example of a primitive variable along with the internal energy u or components of the velocity v. Uh, <clears throat> and, but we don't step rho forward in time directly. What we usually step forward in time with the, uh, the uh, basic equations in conservation form are the coordinate densities. Uh, so the coordinate density, uh, which I, I wrote down earlier, is just rho times the Lorentz factor. Uh, and that's, that's the thing that we step forward in time. But the Lorentz factor involves all the components of the velocity. And so uh, once we're done with the time step and we've, we've stepped uh, uh, the coordinate density forward, we somehow have to get back to the, uh, the rest mass density and the components of the velocity. And in order to get back to that, we have to, to solve a set of nonlinear algebraic relations between uh, all of the conserved variables and all of the primitive variables. And uh, that's really the step that uh, distinguishes GRMHD from MHD. So, so in this business, it's easy to go from the primitive variables forward to the conserved variables. Uh, the things that we integrate uh, in the conservation laws, uh, but it's rather difficult to go backwards from the conserved variables to the primitive variables. And so there's a, a numerical procedure that has to be applied and sometimes that procedure fails uh, either because uh, the procedure isn't robust or because uh, somehow the, uh, the conserved variables have stepped outside uh, the restricted region in state space where they represent physical primitive variables. Okay, so another uh, distinguishing feature, of course, is that the wave speeds are different in, uh, uh, in general relativistic MHD. And uh, just to give an example of this, uh, in non-relativistic uh, MHD, the Alphane speed is, of course, uh, B over root rho uh, with uh, factors of four pi in there as you as you prefer, and uh, uh, in relativistic MHD, this is replaced by a separate expression that includes the inertia associated with the magnetic field itself. And uh, so, uh, what appears in the denominator is now rho plus um, the energy density associated with the magnetic field, and you can see that 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 expression asymptotes. Uh, nicely to the speed of light when the, uh, uh, when the density is low or the magnetic field is strong. Okay, so, so uh, this goes to C, to the speed of light, uh, when sigma is large compared to one. And you'll remember that sigma is just B squared over rho uh, with factors of C uh, ignored because they're always set to one. Okay, so, so the final distinguishing feature in uh, uh, GRMHD that I'll, I'll speak about is uh, coordinate invariance. So uh, uh, general relativity asks us to uh, set up our governing equations in uh, a way that's uh, independent of the coordinate system. And uh, we have to pick a particular coordinate system to to integrate the equations forward in time. Um, but uh, the way most GRMHD codes are constructed, uh, the coordinates can be changed uh, easily. And, uh, and that means that we can do something that, 
the non-relativistic codes can't as easily, which is uh, to just change the coordinates, uh, say from uh, Cartesian coordinates to spherical coordinates, uh, or from, uh, from one set of spherical coordinates to a different set of spherical coordinates that, uh, that has a higher coordinate density in parts of the space that we're interested in, providing us with the possibility of doing uh, uh, so, sort of poor man's uh, uh, static mesh refinement. Okay. Uh, so uh, here's a, an incomplete list of the set of uh, GRMHD, GRMHD codes that are active right now in, uh, in studies of uh, EHT sources, event horizon telescope sources. Um, and uh, many of these uh, are, are quite similar in, uh, uh, in basic uh, algorithmic design. Um, and uh, uh, many of them are also publicly available. So, so HARM is publicly available. Uh, Bach and Athena++ are publicly available. I think Hammer will be available uh, publicly at some point. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure what the status of the coral code is. Uh, we're also developing a code called Karma, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit later on, uh, is a, a sort of performance portable version of the HARM code. So if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, there, there are two good places to start. So one is a, an axisymmetric version of the HARM code called iHARM2DV3. And uh, you should be able to just download that uh, from a link uh, here, and uh, and uh, it should com just compile and run on your laptop. So uh, in a few hours, you can have an axisymmetric GRMHD simulation. If you're interested in doing production work, we have an open source version of uh, that in three dimensions, which is also uh, publicly available and can be downloaded from the same link. So uh, I, I would recommend that as a uh, as a starting point. Okay, so, so one key question, whenever you're setting up uh, a numerical problem is how much it's gonna cost in CPU hours or node hours. Uh, and I wanna go through uh, and, and give you just a little bit of intuition about how uh, costly GRMHD really is. Um, so, so the speed unit in this business is uh, zone cycles per node second. Uh, so, uh, we might have an SKX node on Stampede 2 in Texas, uh, 48 cores. Um, and we want to know uh, how many updates of individual cells or zones uh, we can do in a second. Uh, and uh, I'll, I'll give you that information in a second, but just in terms of estimating uh, the, the total cost of a, a model, if we have an N by N by N mesh, uh, so n cubed uh, zones or or uh, or cells, uh, we can update that in for one dynamical time, with of order a few times n time steps. So that number of time steps just comes from the current condition. So a dynamical time is a wave crossing time, uh, and current condition just says you you can't have the, a wave cross more than one cell um, per. Uh, uh, per time step. And so that means that for a, a dynamical time, we need a few times n to the four uh, zone cycles. Okay, so, so how fast are uh, current codes? So iHARM3D, which I've just given you the link to, uh, is a, uh, runs at about 5 million zone cycles per second on Stampede 2. Uh, so we can just use that to estimate um, how long it takes to do uh, uh, black hole accretion run. But before I, I do that, I just want to say that, uh, you know, GRMHD is comparatively expensive. Um, uh, it's, it, it's expensive compared to non-relativistic uh, MHD. So it's about six times uh, as expensive as the Athena code uh, on a similar non-relativistic problem. Okay, so, uh, so let's suppose that we want to run a 256 cubed uh, GRMHD run, and we want to run it for uh, 10 to the 4 
uh, horizon light crossing times, GM over C cubed. Uh, then uh, the expense in node hours with iHarm 3D will be uh, the total number of zone cycles uh, multiplied by per dynamical time, multiplied by the number of dynamical times, uh, divided by the speed, uh, and then there's a factor of 3600 to compute uh, hours instead of seconds, which I initially forgot when I was preparing this slide a few days ago. Okay, so that suggests that the total cost is going to be about uh, 2,400 uh, node hours for uh, a run like this. And, and that's not a bad estimate. It's off by about a factor of four uh, compared to the, uh, the, the real estimate. There's a, there's a factor of few there in the current condition, uh, and there's a, another factor of few related to uh, other expenses to inefficiencies in the, uh, the parallel, in, in, in the communications, uh, and also in uh, producing diagnostics and output. Okay, so that should give you a sense of what these models cost. Uh, now I want to talk about uh, convergence uh, testing and resolution. Uh, so the point I'm making at the top here cannot be emphasized enough. Uh, and uh, everyone who comes through my group leaves uh, with a keen understanding of this point. You don't know your code is working unless you test it. And that applies both to codes that you write yourself uh, and also to codes that you download and use from uh, that are written by other people. Uh, so, you, so you really have to uh, test your GRMHD code to have any confidence that uh, your, your solutions to this Baroque system of equations uh, have anything to do with physics. So when, when we start to test these codes, we, we start with uh, uh, linear amplitude waves. Uh, and then we move on to shocks uh, and their, their exact solutions for both of these. And in both cases, we, we check the convergence of the solutions. So uh, uh, most GRMHD schemes uh, that are on the market in the list that I just showed you are second order on smooth flows, uh, which means that the integrated error is proportional to uh, the number of zones along one dimension uh, to the minus two power. And uh, I'll show you some convergence plots in uh, just a moment. But if your code does not uh, converge at the expected rate, then there's a bug in your code and, uh, and you have to go back and look for it. So quantitative agreement with this scaling of error with number of zones is necessary, uh, but not sufficient for you to believe that your code is, is working. Okay, so here's a, here's a test problem that we found very useful in debugging early GRMHD codes. Uh, this is an inflow problem that uh, imagines a flow that begins at the innermost stable circular orbit around a black hole uh, and then flows inward to the event horizon. Uh, and it's a magnetized inflow in the Kerr metric. So it's got all the, the complications of uh, of a physical metric, uh, including frame dragging and so on. Uh, and it also has magnetic fields. So it's a great test for a GRMHD code. And it turns out that there's a semi-analytic solution to this. And uh, it's, it's not a very original solution. Uh, it, it basically uses the same, uh, the same physical ideas that went into the, the Weber Davis model for the solar wind, which is a, a one dimensional model for the, uh, for the solar wind. And, uh, and you can see here the, uh, the error in each of four variables uh, plotted against uh, resolution on the, uh, the x-axis and the L1 norm of the error, uh, the difference between the numerical and analytic solution on the y-axis. And just to remind you, of course, that the, uh, the L1 norm is just the integral of uh, rho analytic minus say a row numerical absolute value. Uh, and in this case, since it's a one dimensional problem uh, integrated over the, the X extent. And up here is uh, a line that shows N to the minus two behavior. And you can see that these are exhibiting the N to the minus two behavior that it's, that's expected. So this gave us some 
confidence that we were doing the right thing. Uh, one doesn't have to test only on uh, uh, problems for which there are analytic solutions. So, um, so this shows a test of uh, uh, the harm code against a, a code called VAC, uh, which was written by Gabor Toth on a, a test problem called the Orsag Tang Vortex. And I'll have more to say about this in, in just a moment. But uh, here's, here's the setup for this Orsag Tang Vortex problem. Uh, and this allows us to compare independent codes and see if they uh, have similar, uh, similar results. So on the y-axis here is, is the density, and we plotted the density and uh, the solution for both codes on a cut uh, through, the, through the box in which the solution is calculated. Uh, and then down at the bottom, we've made every effort to show discrepancies by plotting the difference between the two solutions. And you can see that the, the difference is relatively small and uh, uh, is concentrated around discontinuities in the flow where the, the wave speeds are just ever so slightly uh, uh, different and there's different uh, uh, ringing behind uh, each of the discontinuities. Okay. Um, so let me talk a little bit more about the Orsag Tang vortex because this is one of, one of my favorite test problems. It's not a, a general relativistic problem, but we've cast it in a, a special relativistic form and solved it in a Cartesian box in 2D with periodic boundary conditions. And uh, when, you, when you start this out, um, actually, let me, there. Uh, when you start this out, you can see uh, that it produces a compressible flow. Uh, so here, the color is showing the density. Uh, and there are shock waves that propagate through this, uh, this solution uh, through the computational domain. Uh, and then in the center, there's an interesting structure that forms here, uh, which is a current sheet. Uh, and in fact, the Orsag Tang vortex is designed to produce that current sheet in the middle naturally. Um, <clears throat> so uh, let me show this again in a slightly different way, uh, plotting not the density, but the current density in the, the model. Uh, and I'm going to show this at a series of different resolutions. So starting out at a resolution of uh, 16 by 16, and then going up to 8192 by 8192. So this illustrates some of the changes in, res uh, changes in qualitative behavior that happen as one increases the, the numerical resolution. Remember that the current is uh, related to a derivative of the magnetic field. And so it absolutely keys on uh, the uh, small scale structures in the flow. So this is very sensitive to resolution. Okay, so you can see the current sheet forming there and then the current sheet breaks up, uh, begins to break up at a resolution of 256 square and forms uh, that round structure, which is a, a plasmoid. And this is a consequence of something called the plasmoid instability, uh, which uh, is a uh, outcome of, uh, of a, a current sheet uh, reconnecting. And, uh, and you can see that as the resolution increases, the number of plasmoids that form in that current sheet increases. Uh, and once we pass the, the threshold for this plasmoid instability, you know, you, you make lots of these uh, these plasmoids, and uh, they shoot out the ends of the current sheet. And the evolution becomes uh, somewhat different, uh, qualitatively different than it was for um, uh, uh, lower resolution. OK, so I have a couple of questions here. Uh, so what is the difference between harm and I harm? So, so harm we use to just generically refer to the, uh, the set of codes uh, that are 2D or 3D. Uh, it, there are a bunch of uh, derivative codes uh, that have been developed, uh, like HARM PI uh, and, uh, and various versions of HARM from uh, John McKinney and Scott Noble. And so we use iHARM to denote the Illinois version of the codes, current version. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, so Daryl's asking if we understand the resolution limit needed to see the first plasmoid physically. Yeah, so, so there's... Um, 
Uh, there's an analysis of this um, from Lureru and, and others, uh, which says that you need a certain aspect ratio for the Kerner sheet in order for the plasmoid uh, instability to develop. And, and that aspect, critical aspect ratio is, is about a couple hundred. And, uh, and that's when we see it develop in the simulations. Um, okay, so these are all interesting questions. Uh, so are the results of ORSAG, TANG, uh, vortex converged? Uh, you know, it depends on what you measure about the simulation. So I, I would say that the, uh, if you're concerned with the large scale Fourier components of the velocity field or the magnetic field, uh, then they're converged after a uh, resolution of, uh, you know, maybe 128 squared. Uh, if you're concerned about other aspects of the solution like plasma heating, uh, then they're less well converged. Um, and, and so uh, that, that question always depends on the, uh, uh, what, what you're going to measure. Uh, so so uh, Luke is asking, uh, you know, isn't the, uh, the reconnection that's being produced here spurious? Um, that is a very interesting question. Um, and uh, the, the answer is that if you do this calculation with a resistive code, you'll get almost the same answer. Um, and, and Bart Reperta has done some of these calculations with a resistive code and, and shows that um, you basically get the same answer as long as the resistivity is small enough and the resolution is high enough. So, so uh, as, in, as in hydrodynamics, uh, where we think that the evolution of the, uh, the large scale structures in the flow are independent of the viscosity at high enough Reynolds number, so the, uh, the structures in, in this flow seem to be independent of the, uh, the detailed dissipation model, whether it's, it's numerical dissipation as in, as in this ideal code, uh, or whether it's uh, a physical dissipation model as in uh, Bart Reperta's code. Okay, um, I'm, I'm gonna go on in the interest of time because I only have five more minutes to talk um, and then I can answer more questions at the end. Okay, but the, the key notion here is that once you resolve uh, new scales, once we pass that critical aspect ratio for the, the current sheet, then new, new, uh, uh, new dynamics can come into play. Okay, and I'm gonna skip over this. Uh, this shows what happens to the same problem in 3D, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, and uh, I'll give you some examples of uh, simulations uh, and analysis. So, so again, just to remind you, uh, this, this is the, uh, the, the MAD simulation uh, that I showed you earlier with a spinning black hole in the middle. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, when you've run the simulation on a supercomputer, you might wind up with a uh, 1,000 uh, one gigabyte files to uh, analyze. And those 1,000 files have uh, values for, let's say, the primitive variables in them. And you need to be able to interpret that. And that's the real challenge, I think, in, in dealing with uh, GRMHD. It's not necessarily running the code in the first place. Uh, so the major challenge, again, is interpreting the results. And this is a whole, you know, this is worth a whole hour of discussion in and of itself. Uh, but I do want to uh, uh, emphasize one point here, which is that coordinate independent diagnostics are the best. Uh, so those are the most physically meaningful diagnostics. Uh, coordinate dependent diagnostics can be utterly meaningless. And uh, I want to give an example of something that uh, actually had concerned our group over the last few months. Uh, and that has to do with rotation profiles in, uh, in GRMHD flows. So in these, these MAD flows, the, uh, uh, the plasma is rotating around the black hole, is orbiting around the black hole at uh, a speed that's well below the circular speed, the speed that uh, a particle would move on a, a stable circular orbit. And uh, it turns out, uh, as we sort of rediscovered as we investigated this, that angular velocity uh, is, a, is a bad diagnostic in this business because it's coordinate dependent. So, uh, someone who uses Boyer-Lindquist coordinates to describe the black hole will find a different angular velocity profile 
than someone who uses Kerr shield coordinates, which is what we, we commonly use in this business. Uh, a much better diagnostic is the angular momentum profile because angular momentum, uh, specific angular momentum is a scalar, uh, meaning you can measure it in any coordinate system and get the same result. And uh, you form a scalar from the, the four velocity, which is shown here, by uh, contracting it with a quantity called the uh, azimuthal killing vector, which is uh, basically uh, uh, looks like this. Uh, it's just zero, 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 one. Uh, so this is the T R theta phi components of the killing vector. And this just says that the, the background uh, metric is azimuthally symmetric, and so angular momentum is conserved. And uh, that's expressed in this, this killing vector. And so, so if you can form a scalar, um, uh, then uh, you can calculate the specific angular momentum of the fluid. Um, OK. So, so that's all I'm going to say uh, about uh, analysis. Uh, I just want to uh, run down a list, since we have a lot of um, ambitious uh, and uh, talented people on the call about numerical problems that, that still need to be solved in this business. So in, in ideal GRMHD, we're always interested in uh, building a faster code. And I think the speed record right now is held by uh, Matthew Liska's uh, hammer code. Um, and uh, and the, the hammer code, I believe, gets around 100 million zone cycles per GPU second. Uh, uh, we're, our code uh, gets around 5 million uh, zone cycles per node second. And so we're trying to move it to GPUs and with, with some success using uh, a set of libraries to generate what's called the karma code. Uh, and I think this is uh, absolutely the frontier of, of this business. Uh, everybody wants uh, codes uh, that run on any platform uh, 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 at close to optimal speed. And that's the notion behind the libraries that we've used in constructing the Karma code. Uh, they include a library called Parthenon, which uh, uh, extracts the adaptive mesh refinement features of Athena++, uh, and a code called Cocos, which provides the portability. It's a, a, a library uh, that comes out of Sandia National Lab and is well supported. So we're always interested in faster codes. Um, we're interested in codes that are more robust. So we all suffer, every, all, everybody who works in this business suffers from uh, failures of uh, crashes of the code that are associated with uh, uh, non-positive densities or non-positive pressures uh, in the, uh, the empty regions over the poles of the black hole in these so-called funnel regions. And uh, uh, we're all interested in understanding how to deal with that uh, more robustly. And one possible way of dealing with that is using so-called physical constraint preserving schemes, uh, which uh, essentially add in enough diffusion to guarantee that the density, for example, is always positive. Uh, Various aspects of this have been implemented in the Bach code uh, and in other codes. And, uh, uh, but I, I think that uh, those techniques are not yet fully mature. Uh, we're also interested in convergence. So uh, do, do we have the, the right answer for these, these codes? All right, so I, I see I'm out of time. Um, uh, and uh, I just want to provide a list of of interesting physical issues, though, that still need to be solved. So uh, as you saw from the simulations I showed you, you know, we start with a torus that has some magnetic field in it, uh, and, and we let it go. Uh, and it produces some flux on the black hole. Um, but we don't fully understand how magnetic flux is transported in these flows, and how these uh, torus initial conditions might relate to the evolution uh, that would be obtained for a very large scale um, uh, flow that extends out to much larger radius with complicated magnetic field structure. Uh, so, so this is connected to problems of trust, uh, flux transport 
and the, the dynamo problem in, uh, in disks. Uh, we're also concerned about what happens in uh, small scale field evolution, particularly the formation of these plasmoids, which I showed an example of in the orsag tang vortex. Uh, we, we typically run these things for if maybe 10,000 uh, light crossing times, but if we wanted to model uh, stellar mass black holes, which we observe over periods of weeks, uh, that corresponds to you know, billions of uh, GM over C cubed, and we don't have the capability yet of evolving for that long. And, uh, uh, and we don't understand uh, how uh, long-term evolution might, might change the outcome. Uh, there's still a lot of interest in tilted disks, so disks in which the angular momentum vector of the accretion flow is is uh, not parallel or anti-parallel to the spin vector of the black hole. Um, that's, that's also a frontier. There's some pioneering work that's been done on that by Christopher Gill, uh, uh, Jason Dexter, um, uh, Matthew Liska and others, and, and Sasha Tchaikovsky. Um, and then finally, uh, we're interested in disks in context. So knitting together the relativistic behavior at small scale to the, uh, the non-relativistic behavior at parsec scales. And uh, I'm going to leave it there uh, with a summary. And uh, uh, CK reminded me to uh, put up the, the webinar survey link at the end. OK, happy to take questions. Great, thank you very much. So again, let me just send the survey link to everyone uh, through the chat. So please fill that in, because we rely on, that, uh, on the feedback to improve the webinar. So uh, for all the attendees, I believe you can raise your hand. So uh, please do that and I will uh, enable you to talk. But we also have many more questions from the chat and Q&A. So maybe Charles can go through those first. Yeah, so, so why don't I start with the Q&A. So Rambir asks, how do you damp out waves with large wave number? Okay, so uh, the, the scheme that we use uh, uh, for calculating the fluxes, local X Friedrich's flux, uh, puts in uh, exactly as much diffusion as you can, given the time step and the constraint that the evolution be stable. So there's there's diffusion on small scales that damps out those waves. So the short answer. Uh, uh, Francisco asks, what coordinates are used? Yeah, so I didn't have time to talk about this. That's an interesting question. Uh, typically, we use Kerr shield coordinates, which are horizon penetrating coordinates. And uh, so we're able to put the inner boundary inside the event horizon and have it causally disconnected from the rest of the flow. Um, and, uh, and so we just have outflow boundary conditions at the inner boundary inside the event horizon. And there's, you know, there's no cost to that. And it's proved to be a pretty stable um, setup. Uh, Alejandro is asking, uh, What's the best 2.5 dimensional test for GRMHD or in general for hydrocodes? Uh, I, you know, there, there is no one best test. Uh, your code is required to pass all tests. Um, so uh, I think uh, if, you're, if you're setting this up, you want, to, uh, uh, you want to prove that you can do uh, basic fluid flow problems that are connected to the problem that you're trying to solve. So for example, if you're uh, trying to uh, study some subtle equilibrium state and uh, uh, a weak instability around that equilibrium state, uh, then you might want to include an equilibrium test that shows that you can hold an equilibrium for a long period of time. <clears throat> uh, I, I know that's not very satisfying. I, I wish I could just give you, a, uh, you know, this is the test that you have to do, but it's just not, uh, that's just not the case. So Poe is asking, uh, what particular book do you recommend to start uh, getting into the field? Um, well, there's a, uh, there's a book by uh, Luciano Rizzola um, uh, on uh, relativistic fluid dynamics. That might be a good place to start. Um, I think also just uh, reading the, the papers is a, a good place to start. So uh, when we wrote the Harm paper, which is pretty old now, uh, we tried to be as um, as pedagogical as possible and provided a primer on the uh, basic uh, GRMHD equations. 
Uh, Sergei Komisarov's papers I can also highly recommend. They're, they're very clear um, and uh, axiomatic. Uh, and, uh, and then for, for other introductory material, uh, papers by Baumgart and Shapiro, who are interested in applying this in the context of dynamical space times. Uh, they have a very nice paper on uh, uh, GRMHD. And uh, uh, other than that, I, you know, I, I, I think that should be enough to start you out. Uh, hi, Caitlin. Uh, too open-ended. Can you say anything about the unique challenges of boundary conditions in GRMHD? Uh, yeah, so, so um, uh, you know, there, there are challenges if you don't use horizon penetrating coordinates. So if you put the boundary outside the horizon, then, then you can wind up in uh, big trouble. And uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, so, so that's a potential problem. I think we all have problems uh, at the axis uh, in when we use spherical coordinates. And uh, that's also a challenge, but that's not unique to GRMHD. Uh, and finally, we have an outflow boundary at the outer edges of our uh, GRMHD models. And, and those uh, are, again, no different in uh, GRMHD than uh, ordinary MHD. OK, so um, uh, Andrew uh, was worried. I, I thought someone would bring that up, Andrew. So that's very nice. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, so we understand that. The, so it turns out that the, uh, the analytic solution is not fully analytic. It involves an iterative solution to a set of uh, algebraic equations. And the quality of our uh, numerical solution to the exact problem was very breaking down there. That, that's what was happening. That's okay, great. so happy to take any other questions. Yeah, so there are actually two more questions from Tyler in the chat. Uh, one is, you know, why, why do you, you not include the full vector potential in the angular momentum? And the second one is, how does the tilt of this affect the, the jet orientation? Yeah, um, so, so first of all, about the four vector potential. So, so what Tyler is referring to is that the canonical uh, angular momentum in term, includes a term proportional to the uh, the four, uh, four potential, four vector potential. Uh, so it, it just depends on what you're trying to calculate here. Uh, uh, if we want to calculate uh, angular uh, momentum density, uh, then we might do that. But a simpler way of doing that is to, uh, to use uh, the, uh, the stress energy tensor uh, and then contract this with uh, the um, uh, with the uh, azimuthal killing vector, uh, and this gives us an angular momentum current, uh, and uh, that's that's a way of including the angular momentum density associated with uh, both the fluid and the electromagnetic field. Um, so that's typically what we do. It's a good question. Um, and then Tyler is also asking, uh, how does a tilted disk affect the jet orientation? Yeah, so this is a topic of current interest. Um, uh, my reading of a uh, uh, paper by Matthew Lisko, which is now a few years old, uh, suggests that the, the jet emerges perpendicular to the, uh, to the disk at large scale. So here's a black hole in the middle, and it's got some spin vector, and then a tilted disk starts out uh, at large radius with an angular uh, momentum that's not parallel to that spin vector. And then something happens in, in the middle, and this stuff accretes in some disorganized, potentially disorganized fashion. And, uh, and in the process, you produce a pointing jet. Uh, this low density region carries a energy flux out of the black hole uh, by the Blanford's Nyack effect. Uh, and that pointing jet is basically a beam of light. And the pointing jet is very light and uh, can be reoriented by uh, surrounding material. And that's what appears to happen uh, in Matthew Liska's tilted disk simulations. OK, thank you very much, Charles. So we are at the hour. So uh, again, thanks everyone for uh, attending 
is excellent uh, webinar. The talk is recorded, so you will be available on the Pi uh, uh, YouTube channel that I'm just posting on the chat. So uh, thanks again, Charles, and thanks again, everyone. Take me a second to get away. Mm -hmm. See you, CK. Yes, see you.